Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, our only Savior. On November 15, 1903, a 21-year-old Italian immigrant landed in Boston. And he worked various odd jobs for, for many years. He also broke the law. He did two stints in prison. But then in January, note the month, January of 1920, he found a way to make, like, big cash. He discovered that he could buy something called, and they're not around anymore, he, he could buy international postal coupons. And he could buy them in his home country of Italy on the cheap. And then he could sell those postal coupons in the U.S. for about four times the amount that he had paid for them in Italy. A 400% profit. Wow. Now, he quickly uh, got 18 of his friends to invest $1,800. And sure enough, in February, his investors received their money at 50% interest. Incredible. Now, of course, news of this, this great investment spread like wildfire. By March, he attracted $25,000 more in investments. And by June, new investors had poured two and a half million dollars into his investment company. That's about 40 million dollars in today's money. And then by July, people were investing a million dollars a day into this company. Wow. Of course, that attracted some attention. And journalists and state officials started to investigate. And they discovered that this businessman never really paid his investors really any money. That's because he always managed to convince them to reinvest and earn more money. Now, once in a while, there were some people who demanded that he pay them, but no problem. All he had to do was pay them from that huge amount of money that was pouring in to his company every day. And then the investigators also found this out that he never really even bought one international postal coupon. So this company was actually selling and investing in nothing. And the exposure of that truth in the press and in, 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 in the law well, brought this company crashing down. And so in August, officials arrested the owner of this company, Carlo Ponzi. Yes, as in Ponzi scheme. So a Ponzi scheme is a con game. And the word con in con game and con artist is short for confidence. So how do people lose money in a, in a Ponzi scheme? Well, the con man convinces them or gets them to put their confidence and their money in his fake business that is actually worth nothing. Now, in our text, we see the Pharisee who is both a con man and a victim of his own con game. Jesus says, Two men went up to the, to the temple courts to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself like this, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all my income. Now, the Pharisee wanted to invest in his relationship with God. He wanted to be right with God. So he stayed far, to, far away from terrible sins like adultery and theft and corruption, and he excelled in fasting and giving a tenth of all he had. And the Pharisee had great confidence that his works earned him a good position with God. But in reality, his spiritual investments were worthless. The Pharisee's righteousness was worth nothing because the Pharisee, like in a Ponzi scheme, was investing in his own worthless works. Worthless. And you know, the same is true for your works and for my works. Now, sure, our, our works can look good on the outside, just like, hey, uh, you know, the, the Ponzi scheme looked good at first. Investors seemed like they were making a lot of money. But our good works are based on the same thing that a Ponzi scheme is based on. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And that's what God's Word says about our works when it comes to our relationship with God. 
Not our works that we do for each other in love. That's a whole different subject. No, the focus here is the relationship of our works in our relationship with God. And you, I think you know the passages. Isaiah says, all our righteous acts are like a filthy cloth. Paul says in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. James says, whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles in one point has become guilty of breaking all of it. Notice all three verses contain the word all. In other words, there is no exception. Sin thoroughly infects all of us. Sin spoils all that we do. No human work is ever free, completely free from sin. Therefore, it is a really bad idea to be like the Pharisee. He had confidence his works made him right in God's sight. However, the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even lift his eyes up to heaven. But he was beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The tax collector knew the real value of his works. Nothing. Actually, the tax collector knew that his works were worth less than nothing. He knew that his sinful nature corrupted and polluted everything he thought, said, and did. He knew his debt was like an immense tax bill that not even a tax collector could pay off. And that's the confession we need to make before the Lord when we stand before God. We need to say things like, Lord, I'm not even going to argue how that sometimes I am somewhat sincere when I come to church. And Lord, I know that you can see my pride when I give my offerings or when I help my coworker or when I'm actually nice to my family. Lord, you know how unwilling I am to admit my fault, admit wrong, admit my sins. You know how unwilling I am to forgive others. Lord, I cannot hold, withhold my, my sinful nature from you. So Lord, Have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, sometimes, for some people, it might feel like praying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, is a cry of desperation. And some people have heard say, or some people have have heard express it, that, well, you know, I can't be sure that God is going to be nice to me because I've done some pretty wicked things, but hey, I'll I'll give this prayer a try. Well, Well, no. The prayer, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, is not some sort of last-ditch effort. This prayer is not like some Hail Mary pass at the end of a game. No, this prayer exudes confidence from beginning to end. This short prayer is packed with confidence. And you know, it might not look like it, but the tax collector actually had far more confidence than the Pharisee had. The tax collector was confident that he was totally sinful. The tax collector was confident that God was kind and merciful and forgiving. The tax tax collector was confident that God was not trying to to con him with some sort of spiritual Ponzi scheme. The tax tax collector believed and trusted and and had full confidence in God's love, mercy, and kindness. And by God's grace alone, Even though we have not earned or deserved it, you and I have that same confidence, trust, and faith. We have that full confidence that the tax collector had because we know the priceless investment God made in our salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. St. Paul says in Romans, God shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ and Christ alone fills us with confidence to be like that tax collector. Christ's blood and his holiness strip away any fear that we may ever have when we come before God to confess our sins. The pure and holy innocence of Christ creates a calm and joyful expectation that God will forgive us, that God has enough forgiveness for all of our sins when we come before God to confess them. Yes, we know what St. John says in his first letter. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. 
He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the whole world. So again, by God's grace alone, we are not like that proud, puffed-up Pharisee. We do not have confidence in our own righteousness. No, by God's grace, we share in that rock-solid confidence that the tax collector had in God's grace and mercy. Therefore, what Jesus said about the tax collector, again, by God's grace alone, what Jesus said about the tax collector is also true of you and me. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went home justified, right with God, went home justified rather than the Pharisee, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So throw away any thought of self-righteousness. Gladly dispose of the deception of trying to justify yourself before God. Be like that tax collector. Be confident of Christ's righteousness. Yes, trust in Christ and Christ alone with full confidence. And then you can pray every day, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Lord hears that prayer. The Lord loves to answer that prayer. You see, the Lord has already had mercy on you. The Lord has taken away all of the guilt and the punishment of all of your sins, and he does it all because of Jesus Christ. God wipes away all of your sins because of his holy precious blood and his innocent sufferings and death. Now, to end this sermon, we join with another sinner who had great confidence in Christ's righteousness. In our first lesson, the prophet Daniel prayed, My God, turn your ear toward us and listen. No, it is not because of our righteous acts that we are casting our plea for grace before you, but because of your great acts of compassion. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, pay attention. Act and do not delay. For your sake, my God, because your people are called by your name. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.